A little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in uh, Miami, Florida, uh, South Dade County, a little neighborhood called Richmond Heights that does not look like the picture on the screen. That's South Beach. And so when you tell people you're from Miami, they think that. But I couldn't find an appropriate uh, picture to show you guys what my neighborhood looks like, but it, it doesn't look like that. But, but I'm, from, I'm from Miami, proud to be uh, from there. And uh, my parents, I was born and raised there, and my parents were a product of segregation. The first time my parents went to school with a students who were not black uh, was in high school. And this was the mid-70s um, at a, a school called Miami Killian uh, High School. And because of that experience and because of how my parents grew up, my mother was very adamant about how our experience, my sister and I, would be very different. My world was all black in terms of my, my uh, neighborhood and my church, uh, but my mother decided that we were going to be in schools that were very diverse, which is not that hard to do uh, in a place like Miami. But now, there was a lot of pride growing up in my home and growing up in this all-black neighborhood and this all-black church, and my dad was about as Afrocentric as you can get. Uh, we had posters of African queens and kings all over the house, and he would quiz us. And so there was a lot of pride for our people and, and where we came from. But my school, every day, like my friends were from like literally everywhere. My friends were from Cuba and Puerto Rico and Jamaica and Haiti and the Bahamas and DR. And I even had some Jewish friends. So I went to a bar mitzvah for the first time when I was in middle school. I didn't even know what that was. But I tell you what, the food was good. And uh, my friend David uh, had this bar mitzvah. And I remember my mother saying, you're going to go to this bar mitzvah. And I was like, I don't even really know what that is. But, but my mother was, was being very intentional about how my sister and I were going to be raised. And she said that you need to have different skills than I've had. And you need to learn how to navigate a world that isn't all black. So I went to this performing arts school, Southwood School for the Arts, and um, my world was completely blown. And um, I learned about this guy named Dr. Andre Thomas, who is a conductor and a composer who wrote uh, these Negro spirituals, and they were just so powerful. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, I learned about um, the water music by Handel and Tchaikovsky and Bach and all of these unfamiliar names to some of us, but we've heard their music sampled in tracks by Ludacris and Nas and Alicia Keys and Eminem and Lady Gaga, Maroon 5, like all of these people, this cross-pollinating of music and sounds that have so much style and flavor. And then I played sports. I played football with kids like, Billy Van Winkle, and a kid named Tobar, and a kid named Ivan Mandel. And these were all my friends from different places. And then I went to college, and it continued when uh, I pulled up on a campus at my freshman year, and I saw this, this white guy pulling up in an El Camino with big tires on it that said redneck on the back. Yeah, so I done covered all the spectrums. And here's the thing. Like, honestly, those experiences for me, they were a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes it was weird. Sometimes it was cool. Sometimes it was fun. Sometimes it was uncomfortable. Sometimes it was confusing. But what it gave me was an appreciation for differences. And here's what I began to see. I began to see that properness is really a product of preference, usually like our cultural conditioning. And I also realized that what we do in our world is we mix our righteousness with our cultural preferences. That means what we think is right is based off of what's comfortable and what we have grown up in in our culture. And then this is why we have culture wars, because we're looking at these things that are not proper to us and I'm not talking about human decency. 
I'm just talking about things that, that are comfortable to us. And it's these same culture wars, which is why Jesus was murdered. You know why? Because segregation is easier to manage. Conformity is a little bit more of a straight path. And it's more comfortable for me to stay over here, you to stay over there, or if you want to come over here, you got to do it how we do it. And I don't have to be confronted with my discomfort or your unrighteousness or the things that we see in our world that we just, we just know aren't right and maybe we don't verbalize them. You know, things like sugar don't go on grits. Woo, I knew I was going to get y'all with that. I'm not saying that's me. I'm just saying I know some of y'all say that, right? Or, hey, coffee can only be, um, you should only drink it black, right? I know some of y'all coffee folks in here feel, feel that way. Or, or the way you wear your hair uh, it should be only relegated to, to certain cultures and certain kinds, right? Or you can't be a pro-life Democrat. Or all of these other kind of things we have in our minds that, that, that cause us to look at people with a side eye, right? But here's the thing. If we follow Jesus and we practice the way of Jesus, we've got a different challenge. Because it means that we're not the authority on righteousness or properness or acceptable otherness. What that means is, like, we're not the authority on what is acceptable or what is not based off of how we view things. Jesus broke all of the cultural rules, established different norms, and he crossed all kinds of lines. It didn't matter what your gender was or socioeconomic status, your culture, your origin, whether you are a friend or, fr or foe. Jesus' message was very clear. Love God and love people. As a matter of fact, when they came to Jesus and they asked him about the commandments, he said, listen, it just boils down to this. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. As we kind of shine the spotlight this weekend on Acts chapter 10, I love this story. And for those of you who haven't been tracking with us, we have been preaching through our values as a church, like who we are and, and who we aspire to be and where we take these aspirations from. Hopeville isn't just making these things up. We're taking them specifically from the scriptures. And so we're continuing that theme this weekend as we zoom in on, on one of our values. And this story in Acts chapter 10 is, is very appropriate. Peter is one of Jesus' closest disciples. And he saw all of the things that I just mentioned about Jesus crossing these lines and how he hung out with people that people said he shouldn't be hanging out with. And he did all of these confusing things. Peter was with him for three straight years seeing all of this stuff firsthand, which is why Acts chapter 10 is so fascinating to me. Because Peter, who is Jewish, collides with this man named Cornelius, who is a Gentile, or he was a centurion. The centurions were, uh, they were part of the Roman uh, guard, and they represented Roman occupation or oppression, right? So the, the Jewish people didn't, didn't, definitely didn't get down with Gentiles, definitely didn't get down with centurions, anything representing Roman occupation. So Peter and Cornelius are two people that wouldn't be hanging out. They wouldn't be playing spades together, you know what I'm saying? They wouldn't be watching uh, games together. They, they wouldn't not be hanging out with one another. But these two men had the same thing in common. They were devout men of God, and they prayed daily. And then in Acts chapter 10, let me just kind of give you a run-up because we can't cover the whole, the whole passage. One day these two men were praying. So God gives Cornelius a vision and says, Cornelius, there's a man named Peter in a place called Joppa. I need you to send some men to go get him, bring him to your house. He has something to say to you. And so Cornelius says, okay, he sends men to go to Peter. And then Peter is praying around the same time. And while Peter is praying, he has a vision. And it's the same vision several times. And the vision is of all of these different meats that would have been forbidden in the Jewish diet. 
and he hears a voice that says, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, nah, bro, like, you know, we don't eat that. That's not, that, that I would never do that. I would never make myself unclean. And he says this a couple of different times, and what is repeated to him is the voice of God that says, do not deem anything unclean that I have called clean. By the way, if some men knocking at the door, I have sent them. Don't be afraid. Go with them. So we pick it up in verse number 28 where Peter is showing up at Cornelius' house. He decides to go with these men to Joppa. It's about 38 miles, so if they're walking, that's about 12 to 13 hours on foot. So that's a big commitment, all right? And so here we go. They show up at Cornelius' house, verse number 28. We have the words up on the screen. You can follow along with me. Here we go. Peter said to them, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. I just got to stop right there. If you show up to my house like that, I mean, hello to you too. You know it's not proper for me to be here, but I'm here, right? Verse 29, that's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, four days ago at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then, a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon, who's also named Peter, here. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So immediately, so I immediately sent for you and it was good for you to come. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts every nation, accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. I just want to tag this message this weekend for the next few minutes. Accept the invitation. I want you to turn to the person next to you and just say, accept the invitation. The most interesting part of this whole story to me is Peter's response. Because I just said that Peter was walking with Jesus for three years and saw Jesus cross these lines and do the things that he did. And this is the first time he has an aha moment. And he says, oh, now I see. Jesus gave a, a, a great commission and said, I want you to teach and make disciples of all nations. So I'm like, hold on, bro, what you mean? Now you see. What you been looking at? I mean, this is what Jesus has been doing. And it tells me that Peter is a devout follower of Jesus, but his lens still needs to be adjusted. And I think that there are some of us who are devout followers of Jesus, but, but we still need a lens adjustment. We still need some clarity and vision in terms of how we see particularly others who are not like us. And here's the thing. If there isn't a disruption in our psychology of comfort, we will let our psychology of comfort disrupt or derail our theology. And there are two key things that I want to elevate for us in this story. When you go to the About page on the Hopeville website, one of the values you will see is cross-cultural. And this is what it says. We seek to continuously engage across dividing lines of culture. It's not just about ethnicity. It's, just not, it's not about just different hues that are represented in the room. It's not about whether we sing gospel or CCM or whether there's gender diversity and leadership. And all of those things are great. But it's about 
continuously engaging across dividing lines of culture because this is what Jesus did. And I'm just going to pause and put a pin right here because a lot of people are talking about multi-ethnic and cross-cultural church. And if you look around this room, you see a lot of different hues. You see a lot of different backgrounds. You see a lot of people that come from different places. But listen, I'm not here and I'm not happy to just celebrate that we got different colors in the room. That's just called being multicolored. That's all that is. But listen, if we're not genuinely crossing dividing lines of culture that is beyond ethnicity, people who vote different than us, people who have different uh, worldviews than us, people who come from different backgrounds than us, if we're not regularly doing that, then what are we doing is the question. The intention around this whole idea of being cross-cultural and, and, and continuously crossing over these dividing lines is to not perpetuate tribalism, which is a lot of what churches look like now. They look like tribes. And listen, tribalism has, it, it, it has a place, all right, and I understand it, but the church is not called to be that because that is about protection and superiority and safety and mitigating threats and all of that. But if we're following Jesus, he's called us to something different. And Peter's, listen, listen, Peter's initial response suggests something to us. His initial response when he shows up to Cornelius' house suggests that there's an undercurrent of supremacy. You know you know, bro, like, it ain't proper for, for us to be doing this. Why does that even have to be said? And I know this is the way some of us roll. Some of us, like, we walking around with a strong side eye in a lot of ways. Because we see a lot of things that's like, ah, that's a little bit improper or uncomfortable for us. So let me just give you two reasons why I wanted us to, to, to highlight this, or, or, or what is really shifting the balance here in this story, and, and what I hope shifts the balance for us here at Hopeville. Here's number one. The first thing we need to keep in mind is what shifts the entirety of this whole thing is prayer, because both men were praying. So prayer is the main reason why the most unlikely happened. There's an old saying that says prayer changes things. It's not just a saying. It does. And here's the main thing. Prayer, what it does is it shifts our hearts and it helps us to see differently. Peter shows us, watch this. Peter shows us that our personal experiences alone is not enough. Here's what I mean. Our personal experiences with people who are different than us, oh, I go to a church, and there are a lot of people there from different backgrounds. Oh, I work with people from different backgrounds and different places or who have different worldviews. Oh, like I go to school with people who are different. Those are personal experiences. That is not enough to just shift our perspective. Peter shows us this. Here's the thing. When we love God and we're spending time with him and we're in his presence, he changes us and changes how we see others. You know what the prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 9? And this is for some of us that think that we're doing a good job, all right? For, some, for, for those of you who know you need work, this is not for you. But the people who feel like you're doing a really good job, you know what you know what Jeremiah says? He says, our hearts are filthy. And who can know them? Like, our righteousness that we think, hey, it ain't all that righteous. And it needs constant cleaning. So I came with a little help today. I want you to just look at the screen, all right? I want you to look at this diagram. Because here's what happens, right? Prayer, and this is why prayer has to be essential to our lives. Prayer, it increases our proximity to God. And then it causes our hearts to grow intimacy for God and his creation, which then grows empathy in us towards others. 
That's why prayer is encompassing and circling the entire thing. Because prayer is what shifts the balance of the entire thing. On the flip side of this, Cornelius, who is a Gentile, he is also a centurion. He's the group that is in power. He has no reason to be charitable towards Jews. That's what the scriptures say. He was charitable towards Jews. He loved them. He did great things for them. He didn't have any reason to do that. Those people didn't hang with each other. They, matter of fact, Matter of fact, the Roman occupation saw what the Jewish people were doing as a nuisance. They were a problem. Like, if we don't have to deal with them, we won't. But because he is a devout follower of Jesus, his heart is different. And it was crazy for him to invite Peter to his house. Do you know how big of a risk that was for him? It definitely was a risk for for Peter to come. It was a risk for him as well. And here's the thing. If we're going to follow Jesus, it's a risk for us too. We, it, there's no such thing as sitting in the comfortable section on the way to heaven. That does not exist. And can I also just, just tell you this too? Charity and cordiality is not the same as unity. Because that don't really cost us. It don't really cost you that much to be just nice or say hello. Or to be cordial. That don't really cost you much. But when you got to really cross it, cross it over into the people's lives and, and really connect with them, and really that, that costs you a little bit more. So prayer changes our hearts. And what I will argue is we have a lot of people who are following the routine of church, but they're not really following Jesus. And so their hearts have not been changed. And so they are saying that they are followers of Jesus, but but they're really not because there should be some evidence or some transformation of that in our lives. And Jesus said, hey, people will know you roll with me with how you love one another. All right. Number one, prayer. Here's the second one. Proximity. If prayer opens our hearts, proximity opens our eyes. The current world that we live in, we have more ways to connect, but we're more disconnected. Because it hasn't increased our proximity with each other. It has increased our proximity to one another. But y'all already know when we're in a space with somebody, that's way different than electronic communication. Our rooms are more diverse, but our perspective is more divided. You know why? Because we are not the ones writing the story. Somebody else is. Somebody else is writing the story and then telling us, but it's not our own personal experience. Y'all know how it is when somebody's trying to tell you something that you have experienced. You're like, no, no, no. That's not what I experienced. No, it's, this is how it really is. And so this is what proximity does for us is it helps us to write different stories based on our experiences, not someone else's. Peter understood what Jesus said. He even saw what Jesus did. But it wasn't until he was in the room with Cornelius and with Cornelius' people, who were all Gentiles, that everything changed for him. See, some stuff ain't going to change for us until we get in some different rooms. Our eyes are not going to be open, and we're not going to have true revelation until we get in some different rooms. And I'm just telling, I'm just, I'm just saying, if we're following Jesus, this is about being uncomfortable. But, but listen, Jesus is with us in the discomfort, so we're not by ourselves. But if we want our eyes to be open, we got to be in some different spaces. And we got to accept the invitation that the Holy Spirit has given to us to draw us into different spaces. I got one more diagram for you. Here we go. So... What proximity does is when we have an open heart, it, it allows us to see different. So it's not, it's, not, it's not just about the proximity. We have to have an open heart, all right? That's what prayer does is it opens our heart, and then when we have the proximity, we can see differently, right? And the, the experiences that we have when we are in these different spaces, they stretch our comfort. And that helps us grow. You tell me 
the last time you grew, and I'll tell you, is the last time you were uncomfortable. And then lastly, what this does is, ultimately, it helps us with our vision to see others as ourselves and not as those people. And I, we all have some of that, those people, we need to get worked out of our system. Whoever those people are on those particular days. Peter said, after his eyes were open, after he had prayed, after he was, his, his proximity was different, he said, now I realize God doesn't show favoritism. What this means is that God is, is at work. And more than just the people you like, more than just the people you cool with, more than just the people you think are holy, he's at work. And perspective about God, listen to this, perspective about God can change and help us. We can, we can see differently when we enter into the stories of people who are different than us. In my small group this week, um, you know, this kind of came up in, in one of the stories that was being shared. And, and um, in, the, in the group, we kind of go around, we share our personal uh, stories. And uh, someone in the group said that, hey, you know, like I'm, I'm from this area, but then I actually moved away for a little bit and I was working and I went to um, church in a, in a different area. So, so I'm from here and I went to an all black church and, and, and that's, that's, you know, that's what I knew and, and that's where I was connected at. But then I went to this other place and you know, it was a predominantly white church, and, and it was just completely different. He said, but, but I learned a different way to do certain things. I gained an appreciation for a, a different approach and style that really helped me to understand some of the stuff I didn't understand in my other context. But it wouldn't have happened if his heart wasn't open and then he didn't have vision to see. And this is what happens when we decide to follow Jesus and we're committing ourselves to prayer and our proximity is shifting around us. Let me see if I can land a plane for us like this. If we fast forward from Acts chapter 10 all the way to modern history, like right now, specifically our country, there are some very disturbing trends about the church or the people of God not accepting God's invitation. And as a matter of fact, we can look out throughout history how that has been a disturbing trend of the church at times being at the forefront of racism and segregation and division and divisiveness. And it is very, very troubling because God has given us an invitation to love him and to love his creation. It makes sense, though, why we see this kind of thing happening. You know why? Because at some point, we have to make a choice to trust God or to trust us. And some of us are just about, hey, I, I'm going to just look out for me. I'm going to just trust me. If it don't feel right, it ain't right. Well, maybe. And I understand that. But at some point, we have to really walk out what we say we believe. When hearts are not changed, our minds are not being renewed, and it impacts our intimacy with God. And what we tend to do is what is comfortable for us. What we tend to do is gravitate towards the least path of resistance. And we've seen this for decades, even within the church. I love Dr. Francois, who is a pastor up in New Jersey. I love what he says. He says, even when we think about integration in the church, even when we think about multi-ethnic and cross-cultural churches, he said the integration usually goes one way. It's usually people of color going into majority white spaces. It's not the other way around. And there's several other examples of that that I can list. And that's not a, that's not a knock against any particular group. That's just what it is. And it's an example of how we will always gravitate towards what is comfortable. Because we've got our own righteousness, our own properness, our own rules of otherness. 
I have to I have to tell you this part, and then I'm I'm gonna pray for us. Before we give Peter too much credit, before we say, man, this is amazing, this is awesome, I, I, I just want us to, to kind of track with what happened with Peter after this. So Peter has this great moment. Wow, now I see. My eyes are open. God does not show favoritism. He doesn't discriminate. Acts 11, he goes and he tells all these people, and they're like, Peter, yo, bro, you hanging with Gentiles, bro? Like, what's up with that? He's like, yo, 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 let me tell y'all. Like, God is at work in the Gentiles. Okay, this is good, all right? Then we get to Acts 15, one of the most pivotal moments in Scripture. This is when the question was asked, do you have to be Jewish to follow Jesus? This is very, very pivotal. And so it was Peter's testimony. Peter stood up and said, hey, brothers, listen, I hear what y'all are saying, but I have seen God at work in the Gentiles. These are our brothers and our sisters. We need to accept them and not make it hard for them. We're doing good so far. But then we fast forward to Galatians, and our brother Paul shows up, and he got a little side eye on Peter, who's over there, like he's cool with the, with the Jews and and. And they don't know that he's hanging with the Gentiles, but then, then he's cool with the Gentiles, but, but the Gentiles don't know he's hanging with, with the Jews. And so he's trying to keep these worlds separate. And Paul said, yo, bro, that ain't right. Because if we follow Jesus, listen, that's not the way that we go about doing it. And Paul called Peter out. And it said that Peter was afraid of what the Jews would say. Some of us won't see revelation that God wants to give us because we're worried about what other people are going to say. And we're afraid to be in rooms that will make us uncomfortable in spaces that are different for us. And so we're going to miss what God has for us. And the reason I highlight this as we talk about being a cross-cultural and a multi-ethnic church, the reason I highlight this is because there's always going to be the temptation in us to just slide to the side that's a little bit more comfortable to us. It's always going to be there, which is why prayer has to be constant in us because we won't do it on our own. And we will not, as a church, continue to cross the dividing lines of culture in our own power, in our own strength. You know why? Because it's too hard. It's way too too hard. So we have to be empowered by God's Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invite you today to help us. Open up our hearts. Open up our hearts to accept your invitation to enter into your kingdom, which is not just black people or Asian people or Hispanic people or Indian or white or what, however we identify. It's not just Republicans or Democrats. It's, it's, it's not... Pentecostal or non-denominational or Methodist. None of these things exist in your kingdom. These are things we made up to make ourselves feel more comfortable. These are things we made up if we're being honest to raise the level of superiority in what we believe is true righteousness. So God, forgive us. Forgive us for how we have perpetuated this and help us to have transformational moments over and over again where you're breaking our paradigms and you're, you're busting our comfort zones and you're leading us down a path of your righteousness and not our own. We won't do it if it's up to us. We need you. Empower us.